Dr. Adam Downs. Welcome to the Mayo Lab podcast. Thank you very much. So glad to be here. Yeah, I appreciate it. You know, we're based at the University of Mississippi, where we work out of the William McGee Institute for Student Well-Being, uh, which has this Mayo Lab that we're so proud of because it's giving us the, you know, the the forum to have this kind of conversation and to be able to get into schools and universities and figure out how do we meet students where they are in in finding their best selves and their well-being. We have been so impressed by your work. I, I've got to tell you, I've had multiple folks say to me over the past year, you got to meet Adam Downs. You got to hear of the work he's doing in fraternities on major university campuses. And I don't know how you earn a reputation like that, but we're <laughs> going to dig in on that today. But first, let me tell you, Adam. So, you know, my story uh, with fraternities, uh, you know, I, I was in one myself. My sons followed me, joined the same fraternity. My oldest son, William, he had a great experience in so many ways. He graduated from college, honors college, ran track at the University of Mississippi in the same fraternity that I was in. He graduated and checked straight into substance treatment. Unfortunately, he had some successes, and he died eight months later of an accidental drug overdose. My son, Hudson, William's younger brother, at the same fraternity house, he followed his older brother, and he followed me there. And he was found nearly dead inside the grounds of the fraternity house from an accidental drug overdose. And I'll have people say to me, I'm sure you're just so over the fraternity culture. And I say, you know, I do it all over again, because that's what my son struggled with. And I struggled with much the same thing when I was in college. And so I'm not sure that it's the fraternity culture's fault. However, I think perhaps we can improve it. And that's what you're trying to do. That's right. Absolutely. And I think we have to be careful with putting this overarching culture on a group of people. Um, I think we have to be careful when tragedy happens in a certain environment that we just chalk it up to, well, that's just that culture. Mm. Um, Unfortunately, in the world we live in, it's just not that simple, um, and it's not that black or white. And so I personally believe that is there some problems in fraternity chapters across the country? Yeah, there are. Um, there are problems on college campuses. There's problems in every organization. There's, But I also believe that there's a lot of solutions there, too. And some of the most intelligent, bright, gifted, caring, compassionate, empathetic, smart, driven men that I've met have come out of the same chapter that have had men that have struggled. Right. And so if it's a culture thing, if it's just all bad, why are so many great successful leaders coming out of there too? Mm. And so my question is like, what's one person getting out of it that the other's not? And if one person has that type of experience and cares that much about it and can give so much to it and receive so much from it, what can we do to help cultivate that and make that an opportunity for everybody? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it's obviously there. Right. You know, these, these organizations have been around for hundreds of years. Something's working. You see leaders, like if you look down the list of corporate CEOs, if you look down the list of leaders in Congress and so forth, so many of them come out of the Greek system. I, I, me, my own story today as a 50-something-year-old professional, some of the friends that I rely on the most were my fraternity brothers, and I can count on them, and they are, you know, but but we battled the culture when we were there also, because there there are some, perhaps, expectations, if you will. So, so you know, speaking of resumes, you, um, I don't think you'll mind me saying hey, this, I'm an open right? Book. Open I, I, book. That's what I love about you. You have this impressive resume yourself. 
You are Dr. Adam Down Adam Downs with a PhD in other degrees. You've been a chief clinical counselor at a very large group. But if you run on down that bio of yours, you've also got a rap sheet. You spent some time in prison and bless you for the life turnaround you had. But help me understand how you, Adam Downs, go to PhD and you're going to go change the world in fraternity culture across America. So how did I choose that avenue? <laughs> how did that happen? Like <laughs> you, you, you jump in on that anywhere you Yeah, want. you know, I mean, did I choose it or did it choose me? You know, <laughs> I think is the is the better question. You know, I, um, you know, my whole journey. I mean, yes, I, I do, I do, I have had accomplishments. I've been educated. Sometimes my dad tells me I'm, I'm educated beyond my means. Um, you know, I've been able to. Uh, achieve some things professionally that I'm proud of, um, but all pa- pale in comparison to what I've been able to achieve personally. Um, and uh, what I'm and what I mean by that, first and foremost, is is my recovery. Um, you know, I just celebrated last September 21 years of sobriety. Nice. Um, and uh, you know, actively work a recovery program. It means everything to me. Uh, I've been able to marry the love of my life and have two beautiful daughters. Um, and my wife nor my daughters have ever seen me, Mm. you know, intoxicated. Um, and so, you know, it's the whole fraternity world and actually did it, it actually started bigger than fraternities. It started with just my, my dedication to serving the emerging adult population, you know, and I probably did that in, to be honest with you, in somewhat of a self-centered kind of way, I think i kind of made a career out of figuring out like what the hell was wrong with me, <laughs> you know, like, right. like, like what happened to me because I developed, you know, my, my addiction in early adulthood. Um, I started using well before that, mm. but it didn't get really dark until, you know, 19, 20, 21. Mm. Um, and so trying to understand what happened, um, and what happens to so many others? Because look, I'm blessed. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I, I survived. My last use of my drug of choice was an overdose, and for some reason, I woke up. Wow. You know, like I woke up with my friends slapping my face and dumping ice water on me. You know, this is back before Narcan was readily mm-hmm. available, and you know, it was you know, by the grace of God, I was spared, and so it was. Why me? Like, why was I the lucky one? And since I was, what do I do with that now? Mm-hmm. You know, do I do, do I go into investment banking? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, that, I, I can't do that. You right. know, so many people believed in me and served me and poured into me and fought for my ability to walk this earth. And so I just kind of wanted to figure out how to like give that back. And so I started trying to understand that emerging adult population. And the more I did that, and that's kind of like where my research took me. And then, you know, my first job in academia was at the University of Alabama, where I was developing programs for students uh, and then and then faculty in the School of Medicine and that kind of stuff. And, you know, but it, it you know, I, I started working with these young men in the fraternity system and I saw all this potential Mm. and I saw these young men that also like they didn't like this, this notion of the fraternity culture, Mm -hmm. like they didn't like that, you know, and was there some, some, you know, not great things happening in their fraternities? Yeah. But you know what? Like they were like, they didn't want that anymore. They wanted something to be different. They wanted some opportunity Mm -hmm. and they didn't necessarily know how to do that. And so like, I just sat with them and listened to them and said, well, what do you, you know, I didn't go in there with some preconceived notion. Like I had a solution for them. Telling them don't do this. Don't do that. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I mean, if I was looking right now and go, do not think of the color red. (laughs) <laughs> red. Yeah, that's the first thing you think of is red. You start noticing all the red things uh-huh. in the room, right? Yeah. So you can't do that, you know. So I just had to sit down and listen to them. Mm-hmm. What do you want? What do you want to change? Why do you want it to change? How can I empower you to create that change? Not just change it for you, but empower you to create the change within your own chapter. And it started with one chapter. 
you know, so, so you get that call. You get that call. Come help us at this fraternity. You sit down and you have that conversation. Mm-hmm. You make them seen. You make them heard. You're you're validating that. What do you want? Where does it go from there? Yeah. Well, and and it's and it's about not judging them. You know, and not having any authority to get them in trouble. Like that's mm-hmm. like, they're not going to be honest with me if they feel like I have the ability to be punitive. Right. You know, and, and I don't believe in punitive measures anyway. They haven't worked. Well, I mean, show me a system they have. <laughs> yeah. We got people filled up in prisons with it. Yeah. Like that's obviously not working. Um, and so, you know, I just, I just wanted to, they just wanted to be heard and supported and then it's just about helping them realize on a very individualized basis, not just individuals on like per member, but per organization, like what the solutions are mm-hmm. there for them and how to just kind of put some parameters up mm-hmm. and help guide them toward that. Mm-hmm. Because they will, this is the biggest thing, like they will surprise you. Yeah. Yeah. Like they are smarter. They're more dedicated. They care more than the majority of people give them credit for mm-hmm. and their capacity to lead and their capacity to care is so much higher than people give them credit for. Right. And they, and the people don't give it credit for them. And so they don't actually engage in that. Like it's there, it's in them, mm-hmm. but because no one like necessarily expects that from them or right. looks to them for it, they don't nurture it. And so like what, what I try to do and what we try to do at, our, at my company is We try to nurture that. Like you love this organization. You Mm -hmm. love your brothers. Mm -hmm. And I tell the guys all the time, we use the word fraternity brothers, not fraternity friends, Mm -hmm. not fraternity pals, but fraternity brothers. So act like it. Mm. Act like it. Yeah. If this was your brother, what would you do? So when my son Hudson was found dead at the fraternity house, um, I was at the hospital where he's in a coma. And all of his fraternity brothers had gathered around. And they were, I was like, oh, this is just amazing. The ambulance couldn't get here in time. And you guys threw Hudson in the back of your truck and sped to the hospital. And they're like, Mr. McGee, I mean, that's what we do because he's our brother. We do anything for our brother. They called me off to the side a little while later and they said, hey, uh, Mr. McGee, if Hudson wakes up, you know, uh, he might need some help because he's been on something for a while. And at that moment, I know exactly what you're talking about. I understand the leadership that you, Adam Downs, that you, what good looks like your company is aiming to do and deliver in these fraternities that sign you up to help them get there. Because at that moment, I look back at those young men and they saw the reflection in my face. Right. We, we're bragging on how we sped to the hospital because his heart wasn't working and he wasn't breathing, but where we didn't take action when we saw him drowning in substances before our eyes for what they were saying was six weeks plus. They saw the decline, but in that culture, and maybe that's just the young culture in general, they couldn't differentiate. That's part of the education process, how to recognize when someone is struggling. Well, that's well, and and not only like recognize it, but have a true protocol on how to do something about it. Like, here's the thing, like we typically, we as humans typically know how to handle like 911 emergency situations, Yeah. right? Like we have a number, we can pick up the phone, call 911. We can throw in the car and rush to the emergency room. Mm. But more times than not, especially when we're dealing with like mental health and substance abuse, like the the emergency actually happens way before the emergency happens. Bingo. And so, you know, the question is, why didn't they rush eight weeks before it actually before That's the it. heart stopped? Yeah. You know why didn't? Well, and it. You know what? I don't blame the guys. Right. Because they didn't have an instrument. They didn't know. They didn't know either. They knew something was up. Mm-hmm. They knew something yeah. was off. Yep. But did they actually have a system mm-hmm. put into place? Because I mean, let's let's call a spade a spade. They're probably not going to pick up the phone and call his dad. That's right. That's right? right. That's right. They're 
probably not, I mean, they're definitely not going to like call the university. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, because that just brings so much attention to the organization and everything else. Right. So what, who, what do they do? Right. Who do they call? Do they call their, you know, like their chapter advisor, who's probably like an accountant <laughs> and has no idea how to, you know, and, and look, I love chapter advisors. No, I, I mean, get they it. Are, I get it. I but get it's it. like, yeah. I've yet to, I've, I'm trying to think of all the chapter advisors we work with. Do any of them have any background in mental health? Right. I don't think, I don't think any of them do. Um, and Good I'm sure point. there's, I'm sure there's plenty of them out there, but Good most point. of them don't know how to handle mm -hmm. like mental health situations when they come up. Mm -hmm. And so now we look at these guys and we expect them to act like, you know, be a brother, act like mm -hmm. a brother. If somebody's struggling, reach out for help to who? Right. Reach out to who? Like, what mm -hmm. is the mechanism? Mm -hmm. Like that's the problem. And, and we're starting to, as a system, as a country, as a Greek system, as a whole, they're recognizing this issue. Right. And so, but the problem is they're falling short because they're, what they're doing is they're saying, well, all our chapters need a mental health chair. Mm. A, a great idea. Yeah. Do you know how many mental health chairs I've sat down with? <laughs> and they're like, I've sat down with a few too. I know yeah. what you're. I know what you're saying. I mean, they're, and they're, they're like, unprepared. I don't know what to do. Like, I'm yeah. a psychology major. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And they've anointed me this office, but it used to be when you were the chaplain, they could at least hand you a Bible. Uh, yeah. Here, yeah. bless the mill every the night. Book? You know, Where's the like, book? Yeah. yeah. You know, say the prayer before chapter or something like that. But what? What's the mechanism to actually yeah. rush to yeah. be that brother, to be that brother's keeper mm -hmm. before? Mm -hmm. we're on the way to the hospital. Yeah. So right. that's where what good looks like comes in. Like we are trying to be that system, right? We, so like when we go in and we partner with a chapter, like the first thing we do, like the very first thing we do is we build up a wellness commission mm. and you take, depending on the size of the chapter, you take one or two members from each class and we take them through a training on mental health awareness, mm. not a training on how to intervene or how to be a counselor that's not their responsibility. That's not their right. job. They're college students. Yeah. But what they can do is know what it looks like. They mm -hmm. can know what, the, I call them the check engine lights. Yeah. They right. can know what the check engine lights are. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, if, you know, he stops coming around. Like, hey, you know, one of, the, one of the things I ask the guys all the time, do you know what depression looks like in a 19-year-old? Well, like, they don't bathe and they're sad. Sometimes. Right. Do you know what else it looks like? Aggression. Mm -hmm. Aggression is a big sign of... of uh, depression yes. in the adolescent and an emerging adult population. So like all of a sudden you got a guy who's just starting to fight everybody mm -hmm. and picking fights and punching holes in walls. Right. Like, is it because he's drinking too much? Maybe. Is he drinking too much because maybe there's something going there's on? Some underlying issue. Right. Yeah. You know, I tell the guys all the time, like they'll be like, yeah, you know, he, he punched a hole in the wall. I'm like, okay. Well, yeah, he was really drunk. Okay. Was it a Friday night? Were there other people drunk there? Yeah. How many people drunk punched holes in walls? Well, just mm -hmm. him. Okay. So it's probably not the beer. Right. It's probably not the alcohol. If it's the alcohol, the all y'all mm -hmm. would have been punching holes in walls. Right. <laughs> right. So there's it's, something. I laugh else. and it's not even funny. Right. But, but your point is so well made and it's, you know, I saw a study the other day that circulated in all the news outlets on all the apps on your phone, Apple News and so forth the other day. And I almost laughed out loud because I thought, see, this is a news story because everybody doesn't know. And it was, um, I think Alexis, maybe I'd come into the office and we laughed about it. It was like, the study was talk therapy reduces depression and anxiety. <laughs> and it was this groundbreaking thing. And I'm like, but didn't we already know that? I mean, and, and, and rainwater yet, helps crops grow. Well, right. <laughs> and so the concept that we're going to take this group of students and so young men in particular, their, their DNA and the culture of how they've come up, they, they're, they're not, they, they weren't taught to show their tears. I mean, we've made progress, but come on. I mean, yeah, it's, it, it, it's still more cool to show your big truck or your 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 resilience in the stoic face, you know. Um, but the reality is, talk. What you have the chance to do is break barriers to help them identify more quickly, get them into that talk therapy, and like you're talking about punching a wall. Look, if somebody had gone to one meeting that previous week and been able to really get things off their chest, they could have felt differently. Uh, Alexis, you were an athlete um, in college, a, a, an athlete in high school. 
And and you played college volleyball here, here at the University of Mississippi. In fact, did you? I mean, were these kind of issues a, a part of? Is that part of what a, a, an athletic team faces as well? Kind of this culture within, and what do you do with that? You know? Oh, absolutely. And it's a lot of you know, you're an athlete, you're on this stage. You people feel you're looking at people, and people are looking at you, and. You just at the end of the day, if you're sore from an injury, you know, rehab can only do so much. Um, but you're sore from the pressure of all of it, too. And so it just is there. It's available. It's it's how you numb. It's it's what else is going on that you're trying to hide behind that you don't want to face yourself, that you don't want to talk about with your teammates because you don't think they're going through mm-hmm. it either. It's just you. It's all in your head. Absolutely. It's and it crosses barriers, you know, athletes and fraternity parties and all that. They're they're together. They go one hand yeah. in hand and it's just an easy place to go to and you just feel alone in it, but you're not. And that's where people start yeah. they want to talk about it. Mm-hmm. And I think I know I wanted to talk about it, just felt so alone in it or felt like people aren't gonna understand. Do you know on most every major college campus, studies show the two most highest highest at risk groups, your athletes and your Greek yep. system mm-hmm. students. And and my student, my son William was both. Yeah. yeah. My son William, who died shortly after graduation of an accidental drug overdose, he was a track athlete at Ole Miss, three hundred hurdles, as you both know, and and he was, you know, active in his fraternity. And it really shed a lot of light on me. That's that's a great point you talk about, Alexis, because like in athletics, now I will say I think our athletics departments, the big ones at least, are get are ahead of maybe the overall mm-hmm. university culture of universities everywhere because we're we're I think things with NIL adding even more pressure and as you talk about the pressure of injury versus performance, it adds a whole mental health layer. Um, I think though athletic departments by necessity have maybe been a little ahead of the game in reaching out in what they're doing. Your company has has begun to do some of that work as well, right? Adam? Yeah. So we, yeah, we do partner with a university with their athletic department, um, do some programming with all of their student athletes, but, you know, primarily the football team, mm-hmm. because I mean, the football team makes up like a third of the student yeah, athletes right. anyway. Right. But yeah, yeah. So we do. And, and I mean, yeah, we see it, you know, all the time. Um, the other thing, the the pressure, I mean, you got, yeah, I mean, you've got a whole new, the NIL thing's a whole new, um, I think, um, I think a lot of athletic departments are very well intentioned right. um, in trying to sort of stay ahead. Um, and I think that sometimes they could do a much better job in some of their nonverbal communication. Mm. Mm. Um, and I'm trying to be a little bit delicate around this, but like I, I, a very prominent university was giving me a tour of their athletic facilities and I was looking at their weight rooms and their hot tubs and cold tubs and recovery rooms and, you know, all of these, you know, the nutrition stations and all of these things. And then they took me and showed me like where they do like some of the, like the mental health stuff. And it was like this little room in the corner with folding chairs and like still had like boxes of old t-shirts in the corner. And I went and sat down with one of the trainers, one of the head trainers um, in the, that worked in the AD's office. And I just said, I just want to make you aware of something Mm -hmm. like of just what you're communicating to your athletes. And he's kind of like, what are you talking about? And I was like, you know, I just walked in a weight room that you could I could build four houses in, all right, just the budget of it, right? You know, and I and 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 cold tubs with waterfalls and and I was like, what well, you're communicating that you care so deeply about their body, mm. so deeply about their body, state of the art, everything, their muscle mass, their their tone, their structure, their ability to recover from injury, which they get for performing for you, is so second to none. But the part where you actually talk to them about their mind and their heart and their soul has leftover boxes in it and folding chairs. Wow. Could we get you to tour around to every athletic department in the United States of America? And that is such an important message. And and could you Mm -hmm. imagine, look, if I had been a college athlete today 
and I've got a million dollars of NIL money in my pocket, I would be dead. Let me be clear. Yeah, okay. uh, you I, and I'm, me both. I'm, I think knowing your story, I mean, your odds would have been high for sure as I, well. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I think you, you're you speaking such an important truth. And it, it's, it's, you know, I'm so proud of what we've been able to do here in the beginning steps with the Wayne McGee Institute for Student Wellbeing and the conversation, this Mayo Lab podcast and um, other work we're doing is allowing us to really start to have a conversation of let's not keep our head in the sand because, you know, you can't just expect a child to be born, to be thrust out into school and told to make A's, told to excel. Then they either join a team and or go join a social group in college. And all they've been told is just go make A's, do your chores, excel, and don't do this, don't do that. And and that's really a lot of time the bulk of what we're doing around just some family love, we hope. But that's the demand on them. And yet we really haven't provided them in schools the whole being, the whole, you know, holistic uh, well-being education. They don't really understand how to channel their feelings. And then they all show up in groups of clusters, in males and, and, and females in sororities or on sports teams. And we expect, like, perfection. Right. Uh, they, we, we, we have to get in, as you are doing, and help them learn about themselves and in the fraternity case, their brothers, so that they can take that next step in emotional development. And then, so I'm so curious about some of the results, because what I'm told, what I've heard is, a friend told me when they were first saying, like, you got to talk to Adam Downs. He's got this company. They got this company. What good looks like? I'm telling you, if you go check into this. They brought him in, brought his company in to start working with this fraternity and started listing off these results. I mean, I don't want to embarrass you, but apparently in like a scale of like four or five years, it went from here to here in terms of grades. Tell us about kind of what went down with that. Yeah. So, I I mean, I can give you an example of the, like our very first chapter, which is the one we've been working with the longest because, you know, listen, what good looks like it didn't start as me going, Hey, I'm going to start a company that works with fraternities. Like it started when I, when I left the university, a president of a fraternity called me and said, Hey doc, now that you're not with the university, can you come help us? And the reason he did that is because he needed to me, he needed me to be, you know, independent third party, you know, unemotional, unbiased. He needed to me have that neutral stance, which I completely understand. And so it, it, for two years, uh, it was just me, you know, and then, you know, I had a guy that was helping me, you know, work with this one chapter. Mm. Um, and when we started working with the chapter, they were not dead last academically, but they were second to last. Okay. Um, or they were 23rd out of 25. So okay. Yeah. Second to second to last. Yeah. Either way, stinking it up pretty good. Yeah. Um, you know, they had like three members living in the house. The house was in shambles. Alumni relations were in shambles, um, constantly in trouble mm. with the university and with the national organization. I mean, they were just kind of surviving, right. just kind of floating around. Um, and when we got in there and we started to empower these young men to take ownership of their chapter back. And that they didn't have to accept the way that it was, that they could actually make it whatever they wanted to be. Like they could actually leave their legacy and their imprint on that chapter. And so it didn't, like what they inherited, it didn't have to be what they left behind. And that's what a lot of people had done. And if they wanted to continue on that carousel, they could. Right. Um, but they could also do something different. And so it was just like, hey, what do you want? We want our GPA to come up. Okay. How do we do that? So we came up with a plan on how to support them doing that. You know, we want to stay out of trouble. Okay. Hmm. Well, you know, to do that, you got to stop doing the things that get you in trouble. So, but how do you do that? Well, you don't just stop doing the things, right? right? What you do is you set an expectation that those things aren't okay. And you let that, cause I can't come in there and say, don't do that. Right. Or then they're going to do it. But if they, as a leadership come in and say, we're better than this mm-hmm. and this isn't what we're going to leave behind. And so, 
you know, it's been five years since we've been with that organization. For the past two and a half years, they've been in the top six academically, made it all the way up to number two, wow. and as low as seven, I think. Mm -hmm. um, they've done a $3 million renovation on the house, which just shows the alumni engagement and right. how it's back. Right. Uh, their retention rate when we started was at um, 54%. So one out of every two guys dropped out of the fraternity before they were seniors. Mm. Their retention rate today is at 92%. Guys are sticking around. Wow. Their GPA is higher than the all men's GPA at the university. It's higher than the all Greek GPA. You know, they have uh, not received a university or national sanction in almost two years. They've won multiple... Uh, local campus awards, president of the year, chapter of the year, alumni of the year, as well as national awards, most improved philanthropy award, service award, most improved chapter. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and listen, we didn't do anything like unbelievable. We didn't go right. in there and strip anything down. We just went in there and just supported the guys and helped them achieve what they wanted. Mm -hmm. We didn't tell them how to do it. We didn't tell them if you do these things, this is what your GPA will be. We said, what are your standards? Mm -hmm. Oh, if somebody has below a 275, then they need to be go through a wellness plan. Mm -hmm. And what does that look like? So you're going to actually take them through the wellness board, have them meet with the wellness coach to come up with a success plan around their academics. And they're going to have mandatory study halls. And if, if they're below another certain milestone that they set, not us, then the, the fraternity is going to provide tutoring for them. Wow. And it doesn't matter if you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, or right. senior. If you have a 2.5 GPA, your social restrictions are going to kick in until you get it up. You're going to be placed with a brother who's in the same major as you that's doing well, and you're going to have an academic mentor. You're going to meet with a wellness coach who's going to help you form an academic success plan, hmm. and you're going to have mon you're going to have mandatory study hall hours. Can I get this on the professional level? <laughs> <laughs> but this is how. But this is how. Like you want to know how they did it, like that. Like that, that's exactly what I wanted to know. But and, and, but and, they do it all. And, and what I'm here to tell you is. I have been so blessed that over the past couple of years, as we've launched this institute here, as I've put my story out of my journey and my family's journey, I've been so blessed that so many schools and so many parents have invited me into the conversation. And I can tell you the number one thing I get from parents, and I get it all the time, is can you please help me tell me if there's one thing I should know? And what I'm listening to you describe about what you're putting in place in the fraternity system, I'm thinking about every child in middle school and high school across the country. That's a model. That's a system. Because what I tell parents is I was like, look, I wrote a book on this. It's OK. I'm not judging you because I'm telling you what I did. I spent so much time out of fear. When my children began to struggle in middle school and high school around substances, I spent so much time in fear punishing them. What I did not do, and we even bring, I, I, what I'll say is even in, the, in, in university cultures, administratively, what they know to do is punish. I, I mean, I'm not pointing fingers. It's collective across mm -hmm. the system. But what you're talking about is what I tell parents today. What I learned is... What I learned is the first thing, have a conversation with your child. Begin to ask them open-ended questions. Begin to ask them, how do they feel? What do they want? And if I have any major applause and if there's any top lesson from this episode of this podcast that we leave with parents, that we leave with other fraternity advisors, other fraternity leaders, it's what you're talking about. You, you are teaching young people I'm here to listen to you and I can learn from you. Then I can be a part of your team and help guide you there. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I like to tell the guys, like, we got to move, we got to move out of hope and into wish. That's what the, the, I tell the leaders. Like, yeah. I sure hope the party doesn't get shut down this weekend. <laughs> like, I sure hope 
we don't get sanctions. <laughs> right. No, it needs to be. I wish one of these idiots would screw this up for yeah. us. Right. Right. Like, because we've got a plan. Mm. Like, I, like, I wish he would. I wish he would come show up drunk to chapter. Mm-hmm. Like, I wish he would skip his tutoring session because I got something for him. And not in like a hateful, mean way, but a, like a, no, 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 no. Yeah. Like, we're prepared. We have, we, we, yeah, we're prepared. We stay ready. Mm. And, and that is one of the most important things that I think these guys can do. And, and look, this goes all the way back to the 911 call. The heart stopping, like what good looks like is there to try to, to 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 intervene before that happens, but you know what intervenes in it even before that. So before the eight, so like with your son, you know, six to eight weeks before mm-hmm. he overdosed, mm-hmm. things took a turn. Yes. Well, I would say that things probably took a turn well before that. That's right. just when people started. That's when they saw it. the visible sign. Right. But. What I say is if you have an organization that's built around wellness Mm -hmm. and you have a wellness interwoven throughout the chapter and you have a standard of academic excellence, of behavioral excellence, of brotherhood excellence, of Mm -hmm. mental wellness excellence, the likelihood of it starting to teeter sideways goes down. Right. But if it does, it's noticed. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, and then if you have, so with us, we have wellness coaches that are at the houses. So Mm -hmm. like our wellness coaches are at the house a couple of times a week, you know, spending time with the guys. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if one of those brothers that was concerned about your son eight weeks before he overdosed, he doesn't have to call his dad. Right. He doesn't have to call you. He doesn't have to call the university. He can pull the wellness coach aside. Mm -hmm. And say, hey, I'm worried about. Yeah, this wellness coach has been in the fraternity house shooting pool with them, maybe right. yeah. having coffee with them. They're 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 100%. they're engaged with them. I, I call it the the college kind of young life model, right? Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're they're engaged with them, so there is some level of trust. So it could be like, hey, you know, I'm pretty worried about Hudson. Yeah. What's interesting is today, and it's worth noting that those that don't know the story. Yes, we did lose our son, William, uh, after he graduated, and he died from an accidental drug overdose. But our son, Hudson, who was found dead, nearly dead, not breathing, no heartbeat at the fraternity house, he was in a coma, but he did wake up two days later. And as I'm listening to you talk about your method of engaging with students, I know it works because what happened in our family, what happened in my life as a father. First of all, today I'm sober, and now my son Hudson, the one who was nearly dead, came back to life. He's now going nearly 11 years sober, right? Wow. And and what's so special is I adapted my parenting because I had to, because I realized this hasn't been working. And, I, and what I began to do is have conversations with my son, and he'd have conversations with me. Um, do you feel comfortable? How do you feel going into this event? How, how do you yeah. feel? How does this make you feel? And he would share with me and we grew, grew trust and honesty. And now he's kind of like my coin in my pocket. Mm. I, I carry him everywhere I go. And I, I won't make assumptions. So I just know what he's telling me. He's I'm doing the same for him where that engaged listening relationship. What do you want? How do we get there? some expectation of role model, but I'm engaged with you. That sounds like what you're doing. I have to tell you, it works. I mean, yeah. I, I think like, you know, like 750,000, say, Greek, uh, uh, what, whatever the number is across America today. Um, here at the University of Mississippi, for example, um, we had our largest freshman class ever um, this past year. And we're a very, we have large Greek organizations mm-hmm. here, of course, right? And we... I got to speak to all of the pledges. I, we did it um, about substance misuse, and I, I couch it in how to find and keep the joy you want and deserve. These things will steal it, right? And But I, I added up when I talked to the guys and the women, it was like 2,700. So we have this just extraordinary number of college freshmen engaging in Greek organizations. And so the work you're doing— 
being an assist to these organizations, to the chapter, really to the national. But I see it is to the universities because you can do some things they don't do. And because you're outside, you're, you're not the system, so to speak. Right. But, but you've also, I think, focused largely on the freshmen, if I'm not right. Yeah, I mean, that, that takes up such a big part because, you know, one, you know, any, so if you look at risk factors, Right. Every college student walking on the face of the earth is a risk factor just because they're between the ages of 18 and 22. (laughs) Like they're automatically at a higher risk level. Uh, It doesn't matter. For sure. Right. And then you take them and put them into the Greek system and the risk factor goes up a little bit. And then you take them and make them a freshman Mm. in the Greek system. The risk factor goes up even more. So these Mm. are your more volatile, like high risk Mm -hmm. students, you know, that are experiencing, I mean, like, Think about how different life is in the matter of 24 hours. Mm. Like you leave home with your car packed and your parents and you land on campus and you get checked into your dorm room and you hug and cry mm-hmm. and, and then the parents pull off and your life has suddenly changed forever Right. in the flip of a switch. Like the expectation and structure and safety nets and all that are completely lowered. And you all of a sudden, for the probably the first time for the majority of them, have to reinvent all of that from the inside out, right? Like they have to develop that self-structure, self-motivation, self-mentorship. Like they have to build all of that up within themselves while trying to figure out where English 101 is, like while walking around campus going, oh my gosh, I've never seen this many cute girls or cute guys right. all at the same place before. Right. Like, you know, and there's no bell that tells them where to go next, right? So mm-hmm. when class is over, they may not have class again for another day. Mm-hmm. Like everything is structured different and they've got to figure all of that out, you know? And, and they have influential friends because... You feel alone. Alexis and I talk about that all the time. You know, there's this stat that uh, a study that revealed 87 percent of college students will feel very, very lonely at some point during their career. And that's hard for parents to understand. Right, Alexis? I mean, they're surrounded by friends. They're surrounded by You know, but the reality is if you decide I'm going to stay in and study this night, because that's why I came to college, you, you, you log onto one of your apps and you see all your friends out at the neighborhood establishment and you're like, watering hole. And I think like, but I'm kind of alone and I'm not a part of that because I'm just trying to do this thing. So they're not just facing all of that, but they, they may also feel alone. And it's like, what do you do? How do you And that's the perpetual, like comparing your insides to other people's outsides. Right. Right. I mean, it's like. Like you look on, because what you don't see is people posting posting on text, you know, on you know Facebook or Instagram or any of these things, and being like, you know, calling it a study night, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> you know, taking in calculus tonight. Like, no, they are like, hey, woo, you know, yes. you're proud Larrys, you know, yeah, like they're right. they're doing it, at a, they're they're showing a different side, and you're right. only getting like a mm-hmm. a snapshot, right. you know, um, mm-hmm. and 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 that's that can be problematic. But so with our freshmen, you know, we, so we take, we take all of the freshmen in the chapters we work with through through a very specialized program, like educational program where we talk to them about just the adjustment to college, Mm -hmm. right? And like just making that adjustment to all the things that are new, which is literally everything. Yeah. Right. Every single part of their life is new. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it's, how do you find an academic social life balance? You know, what are some of the stressors and potential speed bumps along your way? And how can you manage, you know, this experience and be okay with the ups and the downs and the stresses and the wins and the losses of the whole experience? Right. And we do that through like whole, like whole freshman class education modules but then we, we call them crews. We break them down into crews because it's hard to like have a real meaningful conversation with like 45 guys all mm-hmm. at once. But if we break them down into like eight groups of five, then we can sit down and like really like process what's going on. And so we meet with the crews, you know, every week, every other week. And then we do the education modules every week. So that way, the majority of their first semester mm-hmm. is 
is is there is a lot of support coming their way. With that young you, if I'm right, I believe that there was a day that you pledged a fraternity. That's correct. Would that young you at that time ever been able to conceive that you have now uh, you're in this mission to get into fraternity houses, which is for a lot of people, this mysterious culture, even a lot of parents don't really understand. I, I dare say a lot of educators really don't understand what that's about. Yeah. Would you, if with that young you, what would, what was that young you thinking at the time? Well, he wasn't thinking that was the problem. Um, no, you know, it's like, a, I, you know, I sort of built this for the young me, you know, like I think about it all the time, like constantly, you know, cause my story was, you know, I pledged a fraternity. I got kicked out the very first weekend. Um, and I got kicked out for being someplace I wasn't supposed to be and doing drugs in the fraternity house. And, and that was here at the university of Mississippi. That was here at the university of Mississippi. Yeah, right. Now, did they do anything wrong by right. kicking me out? No, I'm not saying that, mm -hmm. but I'm saying, what if there had been an option that instead of going, you can't come anymore, you can't be around here anymore. What if it was like, Hey, we want you to like, we're going to pause this for this semester, but we want you to meet with our wellness coach. We want you to meet with Dr. Downs mm -hmm. and try to like, because you got something going on here, big guy. Yeah. Like, yeah, there's a reason. Like, you're eight. You've been literally in Oxford for a week. Yeah, and you're in the upstairs of a fraternity house doing cocaine mm -hmm. and offering it to the president. Wow. So, so like you, like Something's you came wrong. here with. Right. Excuse me, like you came here with something. Mm. So get that figured out and wow. come back in the spring, and let's see if we can't work something out. Wow. But instead, it was you're not allowed in the house. You're not allowed on property and i know your two best friends you came to college with are here you can't like affiliate with them mm -hmm. while they're here so then i not only did i feel alone like i was alone mm -hmm. right i was completely cut off from everything like socially i knew here and at that point statistics show there's one direction you're headed a hundred percent and i think that's what happened right yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. I started at the beginning of a spiral. I went home for Christmas break and I just took everything I owned with me. Like I showed up at my parents' house for Christmas break with a futon strapped to the top of my explorer. <laughs> <laughs> like I was like, my mom was like, what in the world? I was like, yeah, I'm not going back. Oh, wow. Like there's nothing there for me. Right. You know, that was in 96. You know, I didn't get sober until uh, 2001. Wow. You know, so it took... Uh, Four more institutions later, multiple treatment and a tour in prison Wow! to get it figured out. Now, I'm not blaming, no, I understand. you know, mm -hmm. but what if, what, what if, so what let if? me, let me have that experience for the other guys. Right. You know what I mean? Like, let yeah. me serve that time for them. Right. Like, let me suffer that misery for them. Like, let, let my parents yeah. suffer that for theirs. Right. And like, let me share some of my experience, strength and hope and some of the things that I've learned along the journey to help shift that. You know, and I think about, and I, and I, I don't want to jump too much here from this conversation, but like, I think back to your son and the four or five guys that put him in the car and drove him to the hospital, mm. right? Like just in this conversation, the focus has been on your son and the, and the, and the tragedy and the horrible thing that happened to your son and to your family around yes. that. What about those four young men mm. that were Who, traumatized by putting I'm so their dying brother in the in the car? And and even also as they mentioned in the hospital what he faced. I want to be I, I'm so glad you brought that up because I, we know them, we love them. Absolutely. We have such a great relationship with them and I'm proud to tell you that at least two of them are now also sober themselves. That's fantastic. It took them some years to get there, but we, we don't blame them, for example, that they said, oh, but he was also on something for a while, but we didn't tell anybody because it's what you said. That, that was the part that really, at the essence, humans suffer. But one of the, the thing that I like your, about your messaging so much is what you're helping us understand is, yeah, humans suffer, but so much of it is breaking the stigma and bringing down the walls so that we can be more aware and more open and recognize it quicker. Statistics show if we get into counseling or treatment earlier, it makes yeah. all the difference in the world. And, just, and it's really and taking that barrier down. And connection. 
This, this, you know, like these four guys, like, you know, did anybody sit down with them and mm-hmm. talk to them about how are you doing? Yeah. Like you just lifted your best friend right. and put him in your car. Yeah. And you did not know if he was going to live or die. Right. And like, then they wrestle like that feelings. Is trauma. And what they told us later is then the party cranks back up a couple of days later. Yeah. Oh yeah. And they're back out there and they've got all these guilt feelings. I, I've been through that. This really, um, as we move toward the end of this time, I mean, we could go on for hours here, but I, 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 I don't, I do want to mention, um, you know, this is the Mayo Lab podcast, and um, here at the William McGee Institute for Student Wellbeing, we're launching the Thomas Hayes Mayo Lab, and it's allowing this podcast to help break the stigma, to help. You know, I knew Thomas and people involved here with this knew Thomas and, you know, I, he, his family won't mind me saying I'd gotten him into treatment. When he came back, so much of the problem was he's, he wants a life and he wants friends and he wants fun, but he walks into a culture. It's not that it's not caring. It's unknowing. Right. Well, exactly. It's ignorant. Right? It, it just doesn't know. Yeah. It doesn't know. And that's so much of our challenge here at the heart of it. And I think that's part of the good work you're doing. It doesn't mean you're going to walk in some fraternity house and save every human every minute, right? But it's about how do we give them a chance? It's that power of possibility by knowing. But it's, and the the, the cool thing is, is it's so doable. Like in, in mm-hmm. one of our fraternities um, in Texas, there's two brothers that are in long-term sobriety. You know, one just celebrated over a year, and the other one, mm-hmm. who just graduated, graduated with about two and a half years sober. Wow. Like, when they entered into the fraternity, they were not sober. Right. Like, they got sober. Yes. Engaged a recovery program. We educated the chapter, educated the people around. The chapter ended up becoming an incredible support mechanism for their sobriety, and like, it's not the chapter's responsibility to protect these guys' sobriety, but if you're brothers, mm. it's to be aware of it. Yeah. Yes. It's to be aware of it and to love them through it and to love them for it. Right. And that's been both of these young men's experience as they've had an incredible fraternity experience mm-hmm. while being sober and actively working a 12-step program. Mm. And still can look at every one of those, you know, young men and call them brothers. Yes. Right. And it's very doable. It is very doable. But it's about education and mm-hmm. it's about love. Mm-hmm. It's about brotherly love. I had that same experience once. I spoke at Baylor University uh, last spring and um, it was to a lot of Greek leaders at one panel I was at. And I looked out there on the front row and I could just see this real kinship among these guys. And they were kind of, it was just this special thing. And I, I went over after it and I'm like, what's this? And they were like, well, honestly, they waited and they paused because it wasn't their job to speak for their right, friend right. and their friend said, okay, I'll tell you like, so I'm now 12 months sober. And you know, this is the first kind of talk we've, I mean, this kind of talk that we've all been to together and they're just looking at me. I think it's helping him understand like what I faced and they yeah. were su- celebrating him. That's awesome. They were like, like high five, low five in <laughs> during the talk because it helped them understand, Oh, you have faced something. Yeah. But what he's telling them is, well, I have, but I've done it because you've been here with me. I say I didn't face it alone because of you. you. Not, and that and that really is what brotherhood is about. Yeah. And what, so like that young man that grad that just graduated with just over two years. So he was our very first um, head of the wellness commission. Mm. And so it was such a great cheat sheet to have a guy in there with, you know, yeah. double digit, you know, years right. of sobriety as a wellness commission. Yeah. But since he was the head, every what we've had two other wellness commission heads since him mm-hmm. that were not in recovery, but they learned from the model that he set. And so they've been, they've just continued to grow and, wow. and, and hold a standard of excellence and a standard of wellness in their chapter that a lot of is rooted in like recovery principles. Mm-hmm. 
That's how you change a culture. That's right. And and that's really, you know, culture is evolving and we cannot sit flat footed and expect young people in this day and age to be able to just walk in this tough old world without being engaged with, without open-ended questions, without tools and guidance for holistic education. It is as much a part of the process as the importance of teaching algebra in elementary school. And without listening to them. Mm. Right. Like that's the, that's the biggest one that I find higher education, anybody that works with this population, it's like they always tend to leave out. Mm -hmm. It's just to listen to them. How do you listen without trying to be their counselor, without trying to be their therapist, without trying to solve their problems as a, as a, as a brother, as a sister, as a friend? So you're talking about from, okay, so like a peer? Yes, peer. So the, the, they actually do a really good job of listening to each other. They really do. Um, but it's about creating space. I think that's one of the biggest ones is creating space for, um, f- for them to... Uh, know that they can talk to each other. Um, and a lot of times it's just like them just being present. Mm. You know, like one of the things that with one of our um, wellness commissions I was meeting with the other day, like one of the younger guys is going through it right now. I mean, nothing like catastrophic. I mean, he's like broke up with his girlfriend and he's super down in the dumps about it. And I just was talking to the wellness commission. They were like, yeah, you know, he's, you know, we've told him to reach out, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, who's going to go take him to get a burrito? Mm. (laughs) (laughs) That's listening. That Mm. burrito is about listening. Yeah. And they were like, well, I'll do it tomorrow. Like one of the guys was. And I was good. Just as I just go take him to get a burrito. And I was like, you know what you need to not talk about Mm. is his girlfriend. Right. But you need to, you know, get his ass out of the room Mm -hmm. and take him and go eat a burrito. This is the size of your face (laughs) and just be a brother. Right. You know, like just do something like that mm-hmm. and you'll be okay. And I mean, and like, I mean, we do other silly things. I mean, one of our fraternities and they all looked at me like I was so crazy when I had them do this. So this is, um, it's they're at Georgia Tech and Georgia Tech is a pressure cooker when it comes to academics. I understand. Mm-hmm. Um, and these guys, it was, it was finals week. And I mean, like I could feel the tension like mm. from Alabama. Right, you know? right. And like these guys were so stressed. And I was talking to the wellness commission. They were like, everybody's like, you can hear a needle drop in the house. Mm. Everybody's just buried in their computer. Mm. And I said, okay, here's the deal. Tomorrow you're issuing a mandatory 45 minute game of tag. Yeah. I love it. And they were like, what? Mm-hmm. And one of the guys was like, what are we 12? Mm-hmm. I was like, you need to act like you are right. Just for 45 yeah. minutes. Wow. Yeah. Well, good advice. I was like, they're just buried into these, I was like, you're this aerospace mm-hmm. engineering, like right. quantum mechanics. And they're just like, you know, like mm-hmm. just, just eating themselves alive. And they were like, okay, I guess. And they did it. And it started with like five guys and 10 minutes in, there's 45 guys, 20 minutes in, mm-hmm. there's 65 guys Running, running frantically around the front yard, backyard, deck, inside the house, playing this massive game of tag. They called me the next day. They were so they were like, "This was unbelievable!" Wow! wow. And they were like, "Oh, this is an annual thing. We're going to get a trophy <laughs> made for next year." I was like, "I love it!" <laughs> and they were like, "It felt so oh. stupid, but it only took ten minutes, and it was like the coolest thing we've ever done." I was like, "Yeah, you just yeah. needed to like shake it out for a second, and wow. then go back and study, like." Like and I tell them all the time, like don't be afraid to be like to be silly, right? Like don't be afraid to like New just college, yeah, just be, you know. And and so that's what I tell them, you know, like trust your gut, mm. talk to them, be present. Sometimes eat a burrito, yeah, and don't talk about the elephant. You know, like right. just be there. It's not your job to fix mm. this guy's that's sadness. Right. That's right. Just be there. Just be there. I think the lesson, uh, take him to get a burrito, play tag. The, 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 let's, that, that'll be the toolbox we'll start with. I know. I'm very sophisticated in my methodology. Uh, uh, yeah, you, you really, I can see you. You really earned that PhD. Yeah, I'm telling you what. You know, uh, Adam Downs, uh, Dr. Adam Downs, uh, what good looks like. This has been incredible. 
I hope others will uh, dig in and learn more about you and the work you're doing. And uh, uh, thank you for the work you're doing to help other students and digging into an important culture. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.